Well, all right, Mercy Road, how are we feeling this morning? Everybody good? Man, it just, every service it increases in the level of energy that's in here, and I'm attributing it to the fact that you got to sleep in a little bit. Is that true? Well, I'm glad you're getting sleep because I have a three-week-old at home. So, I <laughs> uh, appreciate that. I appreciate that. Um, I, I want to talk a little bit about the idea of feeling overwhelmed because I kind of feel it right now, to be honest with you. Um, we just brought home a little baby, praise God, Cohen David Parker Blackburn. We chose two middle names because we couldn't decide. And my wife is an Enneagram 7, so we might as well just pick both options. Because if you know anything about Enneagram 7s, we just, pick, just do it all, right? It's so fun. And, um, and it's been a little bit overwhelming in our household since we brought him home, as it is with any time you bring a baby home. Um, in fact, it didn't, it didn't start out. Uh, it started out very eventful because the very first night that we brought him home from the hospital, and in the next 24 hours, we called 911 twice. Not because of him, but because of all the other circumstances that were surrounding our household that now I can look back and laugh on, and hopefully you will laugh about it too, but it has put us in a place of feeling overwhelmed. We literally get him from the, home from the hospital, and we're sitting over, and I wanted to start a fire and kind of put some Christmas music on because I'm of the persuasion that you should listen to Christmas music starting November 1st because, after all, I'm extremely thankful for Christmas. Hello. Come on, somebody. And so I'm like, let's put some Christmas music on. Let's kind of get some shalom, peace in our house right now. It might be the only time that we do. He's sleeping. Let's kind of put a fire on. And we're, Christy's nursing right next to the fireplace. All of a sudden, we hear, and it didn't, it's like, that doesn't sound normal in the fireplace. It sounded kind of like backdraft. So I look up, and in the chimney, the entire chimney has caught on fire up inside of my fireplace. And so I we all panic, kind of freak out. Christy grabs all the kids. She calls 911. She gets in the car. She goes out to the cul-de-sac of our neighborhood. She's nursing in the cul-de-sac of our neighborhood while firefighters come in with ladders and axes, and she's watching two fire trucks pull up, and, you know, firefighters come in to look like they're going to destroy our house. That's the first part of bringing Cohen home from the hospital. And then uh, less than 24 hours later, we, um, I find, because I'm mastering the margins, <clears throat> I find some time to go to the gym and I get back from the gym, and a eight-point buck has impaled itself on our fence. Apparently tried to jump over the fence and uh, impaled himself in his thigh and was, like, hanging vertically on our fence. And Natalia comes running up to me, Daddy, 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 there's a deer on our fence. And I'm like, huh? And I look out, and this is what I see. And I'm like, oh, okay. Now half of you in here are like, did you harvest it? Did you get some meat, you know? I know, I know where we live in Indiana, okay? And half of you are like, Sarah McLaughlin's like, from the arms of an angel. That's all you can think of right now. <laughs> I don't know what happened to the deer. We called animal control. We couldn't get a hold of animal control at first, so we called 911. We're like, hello, it's us again, the people that just brought the baby home. Sorry to call you within this. And then the next two weeks begin to ensue, and it just starts out with normal overwhelm, because it's, you know, up every two hours, feeding the baby, trying to burp the baby. He's got reflux and gas, and we're trying to get all that taken care of. And, and I'm homeschooling the kids, because normally Christy does that, so I'm trying to figure out all this curriculum. I'm taking them to basketball practice, taking them back, and thankfully people are bringing, you know, food over, so that's helping a lot. We don't have to, like, you know, figure all that, but it is entirely overwhelming the first few weeks that you have a baby. How many of you know it can be very, very overwhelming? And I started thinking about that. I started thinking about how in life there are seasons where you feel overwhelmed. No doubt. It doesn't make you a bad person to feel overwhelmed. It doesn't make you any less of a Christian to feel overwhelmed. However, I wonder how many of us live in perpetual states of overwhelm. I wonder how many of us feel consistently tired, burnout, weary, exhausted, frustrated, can we even go to the next level? Anxious? Depressed? I, 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 I look at Scripture, and, and, I, and I hear this message that sometimes feels like can dupe us. Can we be honest? I mean, sometimes it feels like a pastor will get up and talk and say, hey, the key to all of your Anxiety, the key to all of your depression, the key to all of your worry, the key to all of your hurt and brokenness, and, and all of that stuff is just come to Jesus, right? Like this salvation experience of coming to know Jesus is supposed to fix all of this. The problem is, is that's not really the message of Jesus. But unfortunately, sometimes we can feel duped by that. 
Like just stepping into a relationship with Jesus should cure all of these ails of our life. Like we should be in complete harmony and peace because of that. But the reality is, is even though we may have experienced salvation, the forgiveness of our sins, many of us have so many things that are going on that still need to be healed. And, and God doesn't always heal and poof. Most of the time he heals in process. And in the midst of this overwhelming couple of weeks, I kind of started leaning into a principle that I feel like is very important for us to talk about because I, I, I learned it, you know, really from telling my kids a promise. In, in the midst of all of this, Natalia and Weston were trying to get me to build them a, con, a cardboard um, ice cream truck that they could color all over. Daddy, will you build this for me? Will you build this for me? And I'm like, okay, well, yeah, yes, absolutely, we'll build this for you. But first, we've got to, right, parents, you know, first, I need you to go clean your room, or uh, if we have time, I'll build you, if we do this, or if, you know, if this takes place, if you can clean all your, and for about three or four days, there was this perpetual putting off of if we do, and, and we weren't able to build the construction uh, ice cream truck. And finally, Natalia had it, and she goes, Dad, you promised. And I was like, uh uh-uh. <laughs> I always put a caveat in there. <laughs> if, you know, as parents, sometimes we find ourselves in a space where we have made these promises that are conditional and our kids understand them to be unconditional promises, don't they? And I wonder how many times we feel duped by the message of Christianity because we feel like the message has been, if you come to know Christ, everything's going to be daisies and butterflies and roses and peaches. It's all going to be cured. And then we find ourselves in spaces where we're anxious and we're depressed and we're frustrated. And sometimes, can we be honest, sometimes we even want to, we don't want to live anymore. We don't feel rest. What happened to Jesus saying, come to me, all of you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. What happened Josh talked about this the first week. When people were like, I'm worried about this. I'm anxious about this. And Jesus comes in, Bob Marley-esque, and is like, hey, don't worry. <laughs> well, thanks, Jesus. You see all the future. Like, I'm, I'm sure you're not worried about any of this, but I am. Where do, we, where do we reconcile all of this? How do we find this? How do we, how do we truly find peace and rest and wholeness? That's what, we're, that's what we're looking for. I need you to hear me say this. If you get nothing else in here, I need you to hear me say that God's love for us is unconditional. But his promises are conditional. Did you catch that? God's love for us is absolutely, undeniably unconditional. There is nothing that you and I can do to make God love us any more or any less. He is the full embodiment of love. God does not love. He is love. And he demonstrated his love in this, that he sent Jesus to die on the cross for us. The ultimate sacrifice, greater love as no man, that he give up his life for his friend. God loves you and me despite what we do, despite what we don't do. He loves us in spite of us. And nothing can change that. Can't love you any more or any less. However, listen to me. God's promises are conditional. And I was reading a promise in Scripture in Isaiah 58, and I was thinking about it through the lens of being overwhelmed, and it was crazy because this promise was like, wow, this is awesome. This is what I want. I want to feel this. Isaiah 58 verse 11 says, the Lord will guide you always. How many of you feel like you need guidance, right? You just need direction. The promise that God will guide us always. He will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land. Even when things feel dry, he's going to Come in and satisfy and and will strengthen your frame. And you will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. Your people will rebuild the ancient ruins and will raise up the age-old foundation. So not only are you going to find wholeness and healing, but you're going to help other people find it as well. Man, this is some good promises. You will be called the repairer of broken walls, restorer of streets with dwellings. Then you will find your joy in the Lord, and I will cause you to ride in triumph on the heights of the land and to feast on the inheritance of your father Jacob. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. And I thought about it. I was like, man, that's amazing. But why don't we see that? Why don't we experience that? If that's God's promise, why, why do we often feel the opposite of that? I mean, I was looking at some statistics this week, and I was looking at just like, uh, in the past couple decades, what has happened in terms of anxiety and depression and suicide 
in our culture, just to listen to these statistics, anti-anxiety medication has increased 25% since 2001. Anti-depression medication has increased 400% since 1990. Suicide, suicide rates have increased 30% since 2010, and they now claim more lives than car accidents. Suicide does. And this is not just exclusive to people who don't know Jesus. This is us, people who know Jesus, we're experiencing this. I mean, in the past year, I've interacted with spouses who, who, who were, whose husbands were pastors and have committed suicide. It's, what's happening? Why do we feel so overwhelmed? See, one of the things that Christy and I do with our ministry, Nothing is Waste, is we try to help people identify pain that is avoidable and pain that is unavoidable. There's two types of pain in your life. There's pain that you cannot avoid. I mean, it's going to happen. There's pain that's going to come into your life that has no result of anything that you and I have done. However, listen to me, most of the pain, and I, will, I, I, can, I feel like I can give you this caveat, most of the pain that we experience in life is actually preventable, avoidable pain. And it's very important for us to delineate those two things, what is avoidable and what's not avoidable. Because if we don't delineate that, then we will tend to heap ourselves, we will heap on ourselves shame for the pain that we're experiencing that is completely unavoidable. And we will also be worried unnecessarily about the pain that we could avoid. Does that make sense? And I believe that God's promises for us, there is, it, within this promise, there is, a, there is one central theme that will help us understand how to avoid much of the pain, not all of it, much of the pain of perpetual anxiety and depression. Now, let me stop right here. I need, to hear you, I, need, I need you to hear me say that if you are experiencing anxiety, you're not a bad person. You're a normal person. If you're experiencing depression, you're not a bad person. You're a normal person. But Jesus did not die on the cross for you and I to live in a survival, perpetually anxious and depressed state. We will experience it in seasons, but he came and said, the thief comes to steal, steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that you might have what? Life. And have it to the full. To not just survive, but to thrive. Well, I read you that promise from Isaiah 58. The problem is I left out a verse. I left out verse 13. <laughs> Here's what verse 13 says. So all those promises, and then, if you keep your feet from breaking the Sabbath and from doing as you please on my holy day. If you call the Sabbath a delight and the Lord's holy day honorable, and if you honor it by not going your own way and not doing as you please or speaking idle words. There's a massive conditional statement in the middle of these huge promises of God that he will satisfy and fulfill us and we will rise on the heights of the land. He says, if you remember the Sabbath. That's what I want to talk about today. Ironically, in the three weeks after I brought a newborn home, they asked me to talk on Sabbath rest. <laughs> like, okay. <laughs> I didn't understand the Sabbath growing up, to be, to be honest with you. I grew up in church. My dad's a pastor, and I didn't get it because the Sabbath to me was like Sunday, right? Sunday, you're supposed to set aside a day holy to the Lord. And then there was this commandment that said you shouldn't work on a Sunday, and yet I watched my dad work really hard on Sundays as a pastor. And then there, it seemed like the culture of it was all these rules and regulations that you weren't supposed to go to movies on a Sunday, you weren't supposed to go out to eat on a Sunday, but then my mom would have to cook at home, and so now she's working. And so we're like, okay, well, how do we get around that? Well, maybe we do go out to eat. Maybe that's the lesser of two evils. I'll never forget being out to eat one time with a group, of, like a family that, you know, I grew up in Birmingham, Alabama, and so this, the, the patriarch of this particular family, his name was Mr. Bill, and we called him Mitta B., and he was sitting around at Olive Garden one day, and he's like, I can't believe how many waitresses are working on the Sabbath. Hey, bring me some more sweet tea, please, right? And I'm like, I don't know how did, it just didn't make sense that somehow on the Sabbath we were just supposed to go to church and then try to figure out how not to violate all these rules and then go take a nap. And I didn't want to take a nap, but I didn't get it. And perhaps the reason we don't practice the Sabbath regularly is because we don't understand what Jesus is inviting us into. 
And so I want to help us understand that. I've got three points that I want you to write down. The first point is this. Jesus, or God, blesses the Sabbath. God blesses the Sabbath. The Sabbath was a principle that he handed down to his people, the Israelites, where he instructed them to work for six days and rest on the seventh. In fact, he wove this into the fabric of their activity and their livelihood so much that it wasn't just a six-day to one-day rest or work-rest ratio. It was also a six-year to one-year work-rest ratio. They lived in an agrarian culture where they all grew their crops and they would harvest it. And so they, they, would, they were instructed to work for six years and then rest the ground on the seventh year and not plant anything. And that by trusting God in this, they were going to, God would supernaturally provide enough food on the sixth year that would sustain them through the seventh and the eighth when they were planting new crop. Now, incidentally, the way the Sabbath worked is that it actually worked where it wasn't the seventh day they rested, it was the first day they rested. So the Sabbath, the Sabbath year was also the first year. So when the Sabbath calendar came out, it was the first year you're going to rest, and then the next you're going to start working, and then you'll rest on the seventh. And, and, and so um, we'll kind of explain why that is in just a second, but the whole principle was God was saying, if you trust me, I can do more in your trusting than you can in your trying. Come on, did you hear that? I can do more, God says, in your trusting then you can in your trying. This is the entire principle of this Masters of the Margin idea that we've been talking about this series. Josh talked about it with the principle of the first fruits in the tithe, that we bring back the first and the rest is blessed, that God puts this covering, this umbrella, this hedge over the rest of our finances. It doesn't mean that we don't have to steward properly the 90% outside of the 10%, but that when we bring back to God the first of what is his, that he honors that by us, honor, by us honoring him, he honors that and blesses that so that there's protection over our finances. Scripture says in Malachi chapter 3 that if we bring back the full tithe into the storehouse, he will prevent pests from devouring our crops. There's protection. Because when we bring God the first, he blesses the rest. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense on paper. It doesn't make sense on paper for me to bring back the first 10% to the local church. We look at our budget, we go, we can't afford this. But if you look at it from a kingdom perspective and God's principles, we actually can't afford not to. It doesn't make sense for me to wake up early and give God the first part of my day because I'm extremely busy during the day. But John Wesley, the great theologian, he used to say, man, when I'm busy, I know that those are the days I don't have time not to spend time with God because I need an extra dose of God's blessing on that day. It doesn't make sense for us to carve an entire 24-hour period out of our week when we've got so many demands and so much to do and so much checklists and all of these different emails to respond to. It doesn't make any sense on paper. But in God's kingdom, it makes sense. Why? Because God supernaturally expedites our productivity when we honor him with the first. This principle of rest is not just something in scripture that is laid out, but it's something that scientifically and now in culture, people are beginning to understand. You're hearing a lot, and there's a lot of literature out there right now on mindfulness and meditation. There's a lot of literature on rest and recovery. In fact, I got to um, speak at the uh, Brickyard 400 a few years ago, where I got to um, talk to the, the drivers and, and uh, at their chapel service and some of the pit crew and stuff. And then afterwards, they took me down to the pit. I got to watch the Brickyard 400 from the pit. And someone leaned into my ear right there, the guy who let me you know, come up there and watch it. And he goes, this is the best place to watch the race. I said, well, why is that? He said, because this is where you see who's actually going to win the race. I'm like, wait, what are you talking about? He said, the race, Davey, isn't won on the track. The race is won in the pit. The team that is able to most effectively and efficiently recoup their car is the one who wins the race. It's one in the margins. It's one in the space. It's one in the rest. If you like to work out, you know this too, that it's not the reps when you go to the gym that build the muscle. It's the rest in between the reps. If you like music, you know this. It's not the notes that we love to hear about the music. It's actually the pauses and the rests that bring the cadence to the music that we love to enjoy. There's something powerfully woven into the DNA of our universe where God's saying, let's take some time and let's rest. In fact, if you talk to farmers, hello, here in Indiana, most farmers practice 
switching up their crops every so years to rest the soil. This is how God wove things into existence, that when we honor this rest, something supernatural takes place with the rest. Let's talk about the restaurant business. Speaking of rest, restaurant. I'm a dad. Sorry, bad, bad dad joke. <clears throat> Chick-fil-A. Come on. Christian chicken. Outside of the fact that every single one of us loves it, do you know the numbers behind Chick-fil-A? Did you know that Chick-fil-A has more sales for the past decade, this has been the case, more sales per restaurant than Subway, Starbucks, and McDonald's combined? Why? I believe wholeheartedly it's because the founder, Truett Cathy, decided at the very beginning we're going we're gonna to do this biblically, and we're going to be off one day a week. Now, don't you love it when pastors talk about Chick-fil-A on Sunday? Because now all you want is Chick-fil-A when you leave from here, and you can't. You're like, I hate you, Davey. I hate you. They decidedly put in the rhythm of their week one day of rest to honor God with it. And it not only has led to more sales per restaurant than those three restaurants combined, the megas, right? It also has led to only a 5% turnover rate of their operators and a, only a 60% turnover rate of their employees. Now, you might be like, that sounds like a big turnover rate, Davey, of their employees. No. In the restaurant business, the normal is 114%. How do you fire more people than you hire in a year in the normal restaurant biz? I don't know. Chick-fil-A has cracked the code. How? They've honored the biblical principle of rest. Why? Because God blesses the Sabbath. This is where my family has said, okay, I don't, I don't know if I have the time to, but those, that evidence right there, that's way too compelling for me not to at least try it. And carve a 24-hour period out in our week and say, no, we're going to choose to rest in this period. I'll talk about in a second how we try to do this practically. But God, he blesses the Sabbath. The second thing that I need you to write down, you have to listen a little faster. God speaks on the Sabbath. He speaks on the Sabbath. You see, God, God's voice is not usually a loud voice in our lives. The loud voice in our lives is the enemy's voice. He's the one that accuses. He's the one that condemns. He's the one that continues to just boom, boom, boom with accusation, with temptation, with, convi with, with uh, condemnation. But God's voice, is a, it's a quiet voice. Scripture describes it as a still, small voice. Now, C.S. Lewis says that sometimes God does speak loud like a megaphone in our circumstances, but that usually is a last-case resort when he hasn't been able to get our attention in the margins. But God will speak to us in space. He moves in the margins of our lives. And if we try to conduct our week or conduct our day or conduct our finances where we say, maybe at the end I'll have some margin, we will never have some margin. But if we say, no, I'm, at the beginning, I'm going to put God first in each one of these areas, then God will move in those margins. This is kind of an aside, but I, oftentimes people, as they're looking for direction from God, they're like, well, I just want to hear God's voice. I want to hear the audible voice of God. And I'm like, you want to hear the audible voice of God? Take the Bible and read it out loud. <laughs> audible voice of God. It's not that God's not talking to us. It's that we're not postured enough to listen. We're too busy. We're going. We're blowing. And we're just everything's happening and bleeps and pings and tweets and notifications. And everybody's vying for our attention. And God's a gentleman. He's not going to force himself on us. But you and I need to hear from him. And he will speak in the space. Um, I wrote this down. That there is somebody known in Scripture for being busy. You know who it is? Satan. Satan, the devil. In Job, it says, God, God, Satan comes to God and goes, hey, hey, what have you been doing? And Satan says, I've been roaming to and fro throughout the earth, looking restlessly, endlessly. See, I've heard people say, well, Davey, I'm not taking a day off. Not taking one. Because the devil doesn't take a day off. Well, last I checked, he's not supposed to be our example. 
God gives us the example, in fact. In Genesis chapter 1, we see the account of creation where he created the earth and the universe, the stars, the moon, the sun, everything in six days, and on the seventh day, he rested. Now, was that because God needed to rest? That he somehow exhausted his energy? He was depleted? He had to, like, recuperate? No. God has an endless and infinite, infinite amount of energy. He rested because he wanted to give us an example of rest. And he wanted to show us, I want you to take some time to rest. This is, um, this is where my family and I have really decided, you know, we're going to just like, we're going we're gonna to try to do the best we can to honor this. And we do not get it right every time. There are weeks where it's like, man, this is really hard. But we've started practicing this this year as much as we possibly can by having what we call our Shabbat. Our kids know it as Shabbat. That's the Jewish word for Sabbath. And I work most Sundays, and so I don't, I, I, I can't rest on Sunday. And so normally what we do is we'll do a Friday night to a Saturday night. Sometimes we do a Thursday night to a, a Friday night. But we take a 24-hour period, and we start it at night because that's kind of where we want to, like, set a, a line in the sand when we're done with work. And we want to we launch into the next day with some rest. We want to launch into our rest day with some rest, and we want to commemorate that. So we have what's called a Shabbat dinner. Normally we don't cook. We'll get some takeout or something. We'll sit around the table, and we have this candle we put in the middle of the table, and we call it the Shabbat candle. And so the kids love lighting. The, Can we get the Shabbat candle? And we light it, and we'll stop, and we'll pause, and I'll pray intentionally to try to instruct our kids, this is what Sabbath is. I'll say, God, we just want to pause for 24 hours right now and acknowledge the fact that you are God, that we cannot do anything to save ourselves. We cannot do anything to save other people. We cannot do anything to really provide for ourselves. Everything that you've provided comes from you. The earth is the Lord's and everything therein. Even the intellect and the opportunities and the business acumen you've given us to be able to bring revenue into our household, it comes from you. We want to acknowledge that. We are nothing without you. So we stop right now for a 24-hour period, and we say thank you for providing, and we look forward to how you're going to provide supernaturally this next week. And then every once in a while, I'll go around, and I'll put my hands over the kids' heads, and I'll, I'll pray a prayer of blessing over them. And they're giggling, they're laughing, they think it's hilarious because they're five and six, and it is absolutely extremely awkward. It is. But at the same time, it's so beautiful. That in the pace of this world, our kids are beginning to understand this idea that they can start with rest. You see, you talk, we talk about this in Rooted. We talk about this work-rest paradigm, work-rest paradigm, work-rest paradigm. And I used to believe, because I'm such a high achiever, go-getter, I'd love to accomplish and do and build. And I used to think, man, I've got to work, 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 so I can fully, truly rest at the end of the week. And I started realizing, wait a minute, in Scripture it seems like it's the opposite, that we're supposed to rest and then work from our rest. Well, no, 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 Davey, it's the seventh day that God rested. It was the last day of the week. No, but what did God do on the sixth day? Who did he create? Man. Adam and Eve, he created man, and then he gave him a job, a purpose. He said, hey, here's what you need to do. Multiply the earth and subdue it. He said to two people, I need you to multiply the entire world and subdue it. You think your job's overwhelming. <laughs> now, Adam's fresh. I can imagine he's like, all right, I'm feeling good. I just got created. I got all kinds of creative energy. I have been empowered by the Imago Dei, the creating, creating image of God. I'm ready for this. God, come on, let's go. I got a checklist. I'm feeling like that one, that animal right there, you asked me to name it, that's a hippopotamus. Come on. And God's going, whoa, 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 whoa. Because what's the first day on Adam's job? The first day on the job was... Rest. What? Why? Because God wanted to weave into the fabric of who we are this idea that there is nothing that we can do or accomplish or strive after to earn any kind of favor with God. Nothing that you and I can achieve or accomplish that would make God go, I love you more. You're my favorite. But that, in fact, before we have accomplished a thing, he saw us, he knew us, he chose us, and he loved us. 
what would our work look like if we worked from that place? What if, what if we weren't striving to try to find some kind of belonging or achievement or satisfaction that if I just send this new email, if I just put this thing out there, if I just talk to this one more person, if I just, then I'm going to find the satisfaction and peace and belonging that I've always wanted. It's like, no, 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 no. Let's, let's work from rest rather than resting for work. The third thing that, God does, that the Sabbath does is God restores on the Sabbath. I love this. I absolutely love this because Jesus came and he created quite some controversy around the Sabbath. In fact, there are many occasions where he healed on the Sabbath. And the religious leaders of the day who were all caught up in the legalism of the Sabbath, they were like, wait, you can't do that. You're doing work on the Sabbath. Now we read it and we're like, that's absolutely ridiculous, right? Because Jesus is compassionate about people and he's helping people but I think there's something even deeper than that I think Jesus is trying to set a precedence for us to say hey if you'll honor the Sabbath I will heal you I'll restore you there'll be some kind of regenerative thing that happens inside of not just your soul and your spirit and your emotional health quite possibly even your body there's this phenomenal book. I didn't say this in the other, uh, but I feel like I need to say this because some of you guys might be really scientifically inclined. Phenomenal book by a surgeon called 24-6. Matthew Sleeth is his name. And he talks about what he's seen as an emergency surgeon of the implications of our hustle and busyness as a culture. What it's done to deteriorate our bodies. I believe that God wants to restore us and heal us, and that the promises of Isaiah 58 are true for us if we understand this concept of Sabbath, of rest. Real quick, before we kind of close things down, what does he restore? Well, he restores your purpose. The greatest single cause of burnout in work is pressing the gas pedal and going Mach 6 with your hair on fire all the time. How many times have you found yourself in a job that you absolutely love at first, but because all of the different things started crowding in around you, you, have no longer, you don't love your job anymore? You're like, this is just, just feel like I'm going through the motions because we need to step back and pause. So he restores your purpose. He restores your pace. There's this rhythmic cadence that God has woven into this entire thing where he wants to restore our pace instead of working really hard to try to accomplish things that God could do for us if we trusted in him. Genesis 1, let's go back to the creation story, because Genesis 1 is a really powerful story. It's, this, it's the story or the account of creation, but it tells us exactly how God intended this earth to be. It's funny, Genesis 1 and 2 are the only two times that we see how God really wanted the earth to be, right? And Genesis 3 happens with the fall, and it's like everything else is like, okay, God's working this thing back to fully restore everything. And so you lean into Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, but particularly Genesis 1, this is really powerful because it starts and it ends with this concept. It's bookended by this concept of nothingness. So the, in the beginning, God created the, right, the heavens and the earth, and he created it out of a void is what it says. And at the end of Genesis 1, it says that he stopped and he did nothing. So this concept of nothingness bookends the creation account. And when something like this happens, you see rhythms of this in the Hebrew language. It's usually a poem that God's trying to speak something into us that's really imperative. And Hebrew scholars will tell you that these poems, you need to go and dig for the treasure, that typically in the dead center of a poem, there will be a very, very monumental, paramount concept that God's trying to communicate. Well, in the dead center of the Genesis creation account is a, a particular word, and I'm going to put the verse up here. It's Genesis 1.14. This is what it says. God said, let there be lights in the vault of the sky to separate the day from the night and let them serve as signs to mark, watch this, sacred times. That's the Hebrew word that lands right in the middle of this poem of the creation account. Sacred times is the Hebrew word moad, which is one of the four words that's translated into Sabbath. Ooh. Why would God put at the very beginning of the Bible, in the middle, in the centerpiece of this poem, the word Sabbath? 
rest. Well, think about who the first people who were reading this were. They were the Israelites. When were they reading this for the very first time? They were reading it after they were brought out of slavery in Egypt. What were slaves known for? Come on. Work. Incidentally, isn't this what we are typically known for? Isn't our, as Darren said last week, our worth usually tied up in work? Don't, don't we ask these two questions of almost anybody that we meet? Hey, what's your name? What do you do? It's almost like this entire culture is going against the grain of what really God is trying to communicate to us. This entire culture props up to, up to us. You need to achieve. You need to succeed. You need to strive. You need to do more. You need to try harder. And until you do that, you're not going to find belonging. And God's going, no, not my people. I want my people to know this as the centerpiece of my relationship with them. Rest. Stop. Stop. You are not a slave anymore. You are a son. Rest. Which leads us to the last thing, that God restores our personhood on the Sabbath. I invite the band to come up, and while they do that, can I show you a picture of my beautiful baby boy? Isn't he like, I mean, absolutely perfect? We were talking about this at the teaching team this past week, and, and um, most people say their babies are perfect, you know? But to be honest with you, most of us don't think babies are perfect. <laughs> when they first come out, it's like, oh, it looks like E.T. made it with a cone head. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and then you give these platitudes like, oh, he's so perfect. He's so beautiful. He's perfect. But a couple days later, you realize he's not perfect. It doesn't even take a couple days. And you start to realize that these little ones, they really do not add a lot of value to your life. I'm just being honest. I mean, you can coo and awe all you want to, but at the end of the day, they suck more from your life than they give at first. Now, once they start getting older, I mean, Natalia, she's six, and she's, the other day, she's like, can I go rake the leaves, Daddy? I'm like, yes, you do that, girl, right? Adding value to my life, right? But <laughs> fiscally, fiscally, he adds no value to my life. He takes more than he adds. Emotionally, I mean, yeah, it's, but after a few days of not sleeping, I'm emotionally drained. Just trying to figure out a way to shut this kid up, you know? And yet, the other night, I leaned over Christy while she was holding Cohen, and I looked at him, and I couldn't help but think about the moment that God looked at his son Jesus being baptized in Matthew chapter 3. And the heavens opened up, and God, his spirit descends like a dove down on Jesus and says, this is my son with whom I am well pleased. And in that moment, looking at Cohen, despite all of the overwhelm, despite all of the sleepless nights and the feedings, despite the fact that he has now multiple times pooped, peed, and thrown up on me, I looked at him and I said, this is my son. And I am well pleased. He, he has not done a thing yet to contribute to our family or to contribute to society. And yet, before he even begins a bit of activity, his identity is my son. Isn't this the moment that happens with Jesus too? Right there in the Jordan River? This is before he's performed any miracle. It's before he's done any kind of activity. Before he's done any kind of ministry, God, he issues his identity right there. It's like there was a rest period before his work period. And this is what God invites us into with Sabbath rest. 
He's inviting us into the space to realize he's pleased with you. He's not just pleased with you. He's proud of you. I mean, don't get me wrong. I want to get to the end of my life and stand before God and for him to go, well done, good and faithful servant. Step into your reward. And I want him to go, man, you really knocked it out of the park for the kingdom, Davy. Good job. You put your hand to the plow, you didn't look back, way to go. I want him to acknowledge the things I've done. But at the end of the day, you know what my heart yearns for? It's for him just to look me in the eye and say, I'm proud of you. Not because of what you've done. In spite of what you've done. Love you. Last night, Weston... I was watching a movie with him, and I leaned over, and I said that to him. I said, buddy, I'm proud of you. He's five. He just scored his first three baskets yesterday in, in basketball. And, and he looked up at me, and he literally said, why? <laughs> and it crushed me. It's like, is this what I'm communicating to my son, that there has to be some kind of caveat to my pride of him? I'm proud of you because of, I'm pleased because of. And I was like, is this what we think about God? Isn't it? Well, I'm, God's, God's pleased because of this. Because I can achieve, because I can strive, because I can do some good, because I can, you name it. And God's not just pleased because of blank. He's just pleased, period. He loves you. He's called you his own. And at the end of the day, despite all of the tips and tricks on how to Sabbath well as a family, and we can talk about all of that. In fact, I'm planning on putting up a blog post on nothingiswasted.com to teach you, you know, if you want to learn some tricks and tips on how to Sabbath and how we do it as a family and what we're trying to. That's great. But if we don't understand the heart of it, that it's all about just starting from this place of rest. That at the beginning of time, he communicated this to the Israelites. And he has all throughout time invited us back into this space of rest. And Jesus stepped on the scene and said, come to me if you're tired, and I'll give you rest. It's out of this place of knowing that we are his, no matter what. And we can't change that. And how much more effective would our work be if it came from that place? So I, here's what I want to do. I, I'm going to ask the band to kind of lead us in some time of maybe just pausing, kind of working through this in your own heart and soul. Because maybe today you just, for the first time, just kind of need to enter into a headspace of just rest. Clear out all of the, the to-do lists and the grocery lists and the things I got to make happen after this and the Monday plans and all that. And let's just... What if we just abided in the presence of a God who loves us? So, so can we stand? Can we bow our heads and close our eyes? And with every head bowed and every eye closed, Jesus, I just ask that you would meet us in this space. <laughs> you would help us to understand fully, to grasp in this moment. May we taste just a little bit of this reality that you are pleased with us, that we are highly favored of you. And it's not because of anything that we can do. And it's not because of anything that we can achieve. And in fact, it's despite the fact that we have messed up so much, you still love us. And you still call us to be your own. So God, today where someone needs to step into the first experience of that and salvation, I pray that you would call them to that. And today where someone needs to step into the many experiences of that, this ever-increasing reality that we need to step into and lean into rest, if that's the case for somebody, I pray that you would give them, give them the ability to just surrender and let go and let you minister to their hearts. We love you, Jesus. We pray these things in your name.